in 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 17, we read, Pray without ceasing. For the longest time, I believed that that meant, Repeat to the Lord what you want. Repeat and repeat and repeat without ceasing. Guess what? I was wrong. That is not how we should pray. Today, we'll examine how we should pray. Are you ready? Let's dig deeper. Welcome to the Thriving on Purpose podcast, hosted by certified coaches Elizabeth and Sebastian Richard. Elizabeth is a Christian life and leadership coach, branding consultant, and busy mompreneur. Sebastian is a Christian speaker, Bible teacher, author, and leadership expert. Together, they help today's committed believers to dig deeper in their knowledge and walk with God in order for them to grow and climb higher in life and leadership. If you want to dig even deeper, make sure to visit thrivingonpurpose.com for more free resources and content. Thanks for joining us for another episode of the Thriving on Purpose podcast. And I really wanted to do this topic today with you guys because we're talking about the myth of repetitive prayer. I've heard this so many, many times in sermons, just talking with Christians, you know, part of our daily life. There's this a myth that Christians seem to believe that if they repeat and repeat and repeat the same prayer that for some reason, God is all of a, all of a sudden going to say, okay, you are the faithful prayer. Like this is, you are so faithful, I'm going to finally answer this prayer. Yeah, you persisted for so long that I'm finally going to answer you. And, you know, this goes with so many different uh, traditions and, and beliefs that Christians have where, um, you know, they'll give up dessert as a type of fast and say, well, I'm going to just pray and pray and pray and, and suffer in this way by not having dessert for many, many years, as long as it takes for God to answer this prayer concerning this thing that I'm asking him for. And I'm going to repeat and repeat and repeat and repeat that prayer every day until he answers. And then years go by and they wonder why God didn't answer their prayer. So that's why we want to talk about this because we've listened to amazing Bible teachers talk about the power of prayer and how to pray. And we realize that even if we were Christians for many, 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 many years, um, you know, I was dedicated in the church. I was raised in the church. I'm 39 today. I've heard many, many sermons and been around, you know, a lot of um, good, you know, teachers that taught doctrine and taught all kinds of you know, dove into the Bible deep and I never learned how to pray properly. Mm -hmm. Even if I got all this instruction and went a whole year at a Bible college, I did not know how to pray properly and I had no clue. I had and, no clue. And by the way, guys, that doesn't mean that today we're amazing prayer warriors who always have it down pat and who get our prayers answered every single time. That's not what we're saying. But what we're saying is that we've been through the recent years uh, we've been schooled in prayer by listening to men who have had tremendous ministries that were based on faith mm -hmm. and prayer. So by listening to these people, to these teachers, these faith teachers, we understood that we didn't understand, basically, how to pray at all. And uh, uh, Liz, you were mentioning earlier that some people pray every day for the same thing over and over and over again and in some churches and more maybe more conservative churches uh these people are admired oh they're so persistent in prayer they are praying without ceasing therefore we admire their faith quote unquote and here's the problem with that they don't have any faith and that's why they need to pray so many times over and over and over 
and over again because the first time they were in faith, the second time they were in faith, the third time they were in faith, the fourth and sixth and sixteenth and the one hundred and sixty-five times they weren't, they still weren't in faith. But the religious minds, as I used to be, we'd look at that and be like, "Wow, she's been praying for the salvation of so and so for five years. What a godly person!" And you know, and we take this, we understand this because we base it on this verse that Sebastian's going to read. Yeah, so yeah, the, the verse is the verse we presented initially, but let's put a little bit more in context. So it's 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, uh, verses 16 to 18, and it says, uh, in the New International Version, it says, Rejoice always. See, initially in the, in the uh, introduction, I said it was from another version, and most versions translate it this way, pray without ceasing. But in the NIV, it's very interesting. Verse 17 says, pray continually. Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. And this is very, very short instruction on how we should pray. It's uh, three, three parts, basically. The first part is to rejoice always and always give thanks, right? Why? Because a joyful heart brings up a positive spirit. And a positive spirit will speak positive words, and bring good things to your life. You know, a negative spirit rarely attracts good things. And so Paul knows this, so that's why he's telling us to rejoice in all circumstances. Rejoice always. And in the last part, uh, in verse 18, he says, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. So the first part says rejoice, and it sandwiches the pray continually, or the pray without ceasing part, with the other part of the sandwich, which says give thanks. So first part, rejoice, and the other part, give thanks. Sandwiches, pray without ceasing. And the pray without ceasing, like I mentioned earlier in the the NIV, it says pray continually. And I prefer that rendition uh, because we're going to get into a commentary. The, 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 uh, what's the name of the commentary, Liz? Yeah, so I'm going to read it to you. It's the Bible Knowledge Commentary. It's existed for many, many years. It's an exposition of the scriptures by Dallas Seminary The faculty. Dallas Theological Seminary, yeah. It's a very popular commentary, but before we, get, we dig into the commentary, I just want to add, like I was saying, that in the NIV, it says, pray continually. See, pray without ceasing, when you read that, it might be misinterpreted as pray repetitively or pr- repeat the same thing over and over without ceasing every day, every day, every day. And a lot of Christians fall in that kind of prayer trap, I guess you could say. But I want you to read from that commentary because it kind of clarifies it and goes more along what it says in in the NIV that says pray continually. Could you read the commentary, what they have to say about the the passage? Yeah, so it says, um, These exhortations are dealing with attitudes are addressed to believers as individuals concerning their personal lives before God. Okay, so this is your personal spiritual uh, growth that you're doing on a daily basis. Mm -hmm. God wants his people to be joyful and he gives them every reason to be. Mm -hmm. But Paul knew human nature well enough to sense the need for a reminder to rejoice at all times. Mm -hmm. The Christian who remains in sadness and depression really breaks a commandment in some direction or other he mistrusts God his power, providence, and forgiveness. Mm-hmm. And really, it's true because, you know, depression is a result of your lack of faith, basically, to an extent where it's affecting you tremendously mentally, right? Mm-hmm. And so he now he's commenta- commentating on verse 17. Continual prayer is not prayer that prevails without any interruption. Continual prayer is not prayer that prevails without interruption, but prayer that continues whenever possible. Mm. The adverb for continually was used in Greek of a hacking cough. Paul was speaking of maintaining continuous fellowship with God as much as possible in the midst of daily living in which concentration is frequently broken. Mm. So basically, it's at the verse is advocating when it says pray without ceasing. It's basically breathe prayer. 
breathe, Let it be prayer. part, of, Let your it daily be part of your daily living constantly. So in all you do, invite heaven down to earth by always constantly being in communion with God. Exactly. And the more that we studied about, you know, um, the power of the tongue, we realize how much that is to be true in a, on a daily basis, what you speak. And it's not just being positive and talking positive. We're talking about confessing, saying, speaking for things that you want to be happening in your daily life. So, and the more you study this, the more you realize even your children, because, you know, life happens because there's all kinds of ne negative things happen at school or whatever, we realize that, you know, our kids sometimes will say things that are negative and they're actually not realizing that they're kind of um, willing something negative to happen to them just by their words. So the more you study about the power of the tongue, the more you realize how powerful that is to co constantly be, uh, you know, proclaiming uh, positive things that God's going to yeah. do for every little situation in your daily life. So, and, and you're to pray regularly and it, you know, people, it, it makes me laugh because people sometimes tend to make this whole big devotional thing that lasts like forever in the morning. Yeah, they're going to read their Bibles two hours in the morning without ever proclaiming with their tongue any part of it and then go on with their day thinking i, oh, I, I was have... so godly i read the bible and i know more of my scripture well you studied the bible and that's great but god wants this continuous communion with you where you're implicating him you're praising him constantly you're you're thanking him for everything that you see that he's blessing you with that you have um even if you're in a situation where you know, you're, you're, you know, maybe going through hard times, there's always something positive that you can be thankful for. And if you have, you know, you're in, a, in that kind of situation, well, you need to be confessing what you want to happen, Amen. you know? So uh, someone said once, um, he was talking about his, his wallet and he was saying, you know, a lot of people, when they don't have money, they say, oh, I don't have money. I'm broke. Mm -hmm. I can't buy this right now because I'm broke. Well, you're saying you're broke, you're confessing you're broke, you're making it happen even more. Like you're you're basically saying you're I am reinforcing Exactly. That. I wanna stay stuck. That's yeah. why I keep on saying that. And instead of saying, you know, the money the money will come. You know, like sometimes your kids like let's say you're you're on a budget and your kids ask you for something. The logical answer that we used to say would have been, uh, mommy doesn't have money right now, so I can't buy you this or you know, we don't have the money or we're broke or, uh, you know, some something like that confessing th this present situation, which we didn't realize was helping us stay stuck it in that situation. Yeah. So by saying, you know, uh, eventually I'll be able to purchase this or, uh, you know, the, the money has not come yet, but it will, uh, you know, always saying in a positive way that it's going to come eventually, uh, you know, soon, or uh, we are waiting on God for a certain thing, or we are praying for a certain thing, or we are, um, you know, waiting for our abundance, or uh, what else could we say? There's we so know we, are, we, we will be blessed, you know, by God's As soon as we're providence. blessed, we'll buy you this, or, uh, you know, uh, just speaking it differently. Instead of confessing things that are, confess things that you want. So, and I know it sounds counterintuitive to do that, but uh, I, I gave the example once of the, a thermostat. See, our tongue and our confessions and our prayer life should work, and it does work, just like a thermostat. In your house, let's say it's, uh, well, we use Celsius uh, here in Canada, but let's say it's 17 Celsius, which is pretty, pretty brisk in a house, and you want it to be 21 degrees. Well, you're not going to go set your thermostat at 17. Like You're not going to reason like, well, it's 17. Therefore, I'm going to set my thermostat at 17 so that it, it jives with what is. No, you're going to set your thermostat at the thing you want. So you want it to be 21. You're going to set your thermostat at 21. And guess what? 21 will come. 21 degrees will happen through the heating uh, apparatus in your house. It's going to start heating up and the temperature in the house is going to rise to the level where you set it. Well, it's the same thing with your, with your tongue. 
When you confess you're broke, when you say you're broke, you're not confessing the abundance that God already gave you because the scripture is very clear about how none of us should be poor, that he's the one who gives us the ability to create wealth, that my God shall supply all you need with glory in Christ Jesus. All these things are scriptural. Uh, also the one in Proverbs, that it is um, uh, God delights in the prosperity of his servant. Hello. These are all scriptural things that you need to call forth instead of confessing. And, and we're using the example of broke, but it can apply to anything. It can apply to you being sick. It can apply to you being in lack of anything. So whenever you confess what is, you're keeping it as is. When you confess what you want, well, it starts slowly to work with God's mind manifesting in your life, coming to basically what we call in Christianese, it's an answer to prayer, right? Mm -hmm. So when you use your tongue to confess what you want, you're making it happen. And, and, and see, this, and the, when you've asked, like when we're talking about prayer, and you know it's part of your daily life, you're praying unceasingly, not for the same thing, but for that need or for that thing that you know is going going to help you expand in God's kingdom, because your you know, you have to remember the kingdom of God lives inside of you. So everything that you need is part of the kingdom's need here on earth. Amen. So if you need to advance for the kingdom, and that means that you need a certain tool to, to bring you to and from a certain place, like your vehicle, or, you know, you're in need of a house that doesn't have a roof that leaks, or, you know, whatever it may be, you can ask him. But like I was saying, is that you're also thanking God and saying in advance, you're thanking him for what you prayed for. So instead of repeating every day saying, Lord, I need a new roof. My roof is leaking. Lord, my kids are going to have wet beds because the, the water's leaking, you know, People just find creative ways to pray the same thing over and over again. Yeah. Instead of doing that, you know, instead pray with your kids and say, we are so blessed. God is going to provide for us to be able to fix this roof or we're going to be able to move soon because the blessings are coming. It's so exciting. I'm so excited to see how God is going to bless us. When you're talking like this, you're making heaven shake. You're making this happen here on earth. It's going to happen because you are putting your faith and saying, God, I know you're going to do this. Yeah. So I'm not going to repeat and repeat and repeat because I know you're not deaf. I know you can hear me. I know you also know what I need before I ask you because you are God. Amen. So now I'm going to prove to you that I believe you're going to answer because I'm going to act by thankfulness and I'm going to confess the blessings to come. Amen. So that's, a, that's how we're you, supposed to use these verses instead of repeating and repeating and then wondering why God's not answering. Yeah. Because you're basically saying, you're kind of saying, God, I think you're deaf because you don't hear me. <laughs> so I'm going to repeat and repeat and repeat and hope you think I'm faithful by doing this. Exactly. This is basically and, where we're taught and in see, church. That's, it's the same thing. It, look, we're operating on the fact, first of all, that he is God. Never forget that he is God and he is perfect. And if he uttered or if he wrote down a promise in the Bible, he's not going to go back on it. He's God. When you make a promise to your child, I promise you whatever. You say, you do that promise to your kid. And a week later, said, the kid comes and says, Dad, uh, you're so awesome. Thank you for promising me last week. You promised blah, 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 blah by this week. Uh, is it going to be today? Now, we're imperfect, right? We forget sometimes what we promise. But I know as a parent, as a father, when I promise something, if I'm reminded of it, especially if I'm re reminded in such a kind way as, Dad, thank you so much for promising me this last week. Is it going to happen today? I'm going to be on my best behavior. I'm going to go to my kid. I'm say, oh, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, it's today. Yeah, I'm doing it now. I I'm going to do this now for you. And you're well, human. You're not And God. I'm human. So that, that comes back to, to Jesus saying, you know, you who are evil and know how to give good things to your kids, how much more God will he not give you good things? And, and, and that's the thing with God. He, didn't, he doesn't forget his promise. He's not imperfect that he should forget his promises. He remembers. So when we praise him, when we give him thanks for his promises, like Miles Monroe once said, when you praise a king, you put pressure 
on the king. And I love that because that's exactly what it does. When you give thanks to God and you praise him for his promises, it puts pressure on the king, who is God, our father, to deliver the promise. Because guess what? He's got pride in who he is. And yeah. it's the right, it's, and I, I don't like the word pride because in French we have two, two types of words for pride. In English there's only one word. Not the ego pride, not the bad pride, but the, the pride that, hey, I'm God and I, I honor my word. Yeah. And he's got pride in that and he won't let you down. And I would say even before that part, when you're asking and you're praying for that first time for that thing that you need, I would say, you know, go get a, a Bible promise, a verse that, you know, like God shall supply all your needs, like a promise that you're stating at the same State time, it God, with your tongue. I know that you will supply my need because, because you, said, you said in your word in this and this chapter and read it out loud, Amen. you know, because that makes it, you know, it basically you're saying it has to be said by you for it to, to really take place into the kingdom realm, into the spiritual realm, so that you're acknowledging his promise, that you're aware of it, that you know it, you're manifesting it, you're saying it shall happen because I'm reading it in the scripture and I know it's true and I'm telling you I know it's true. Yeah. Like you have to say it, yeah. not just read it. Exactly. And, and another thing is when we were talking about repetitive prayer, you know, we were giving the example of someone in church who, who's been praying, for example, for, for the salvation of, of someone in their family for the last five years, day after day after day after day. And we admire that. And, and it's just, that's just not the way we're taught to pray in the scriptures. And I'll give you a couple of ex a scriptural examples. Of course, there's Jesus in Matthew chapter 6, verse 7. He says, and when you pray... Do not keep on babbling like pagans, for they think they will be heard because of their many words. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask Him. So, like I said before, God's perfect. He knows what you need. He, he remembers His promises perfectly. And guess what? He doesn't want anyone to perish. Hello. That's one part. Like we're talking about... The, the salvation of your loved ones, he doesn't want anyone to perish. So you know you're already in his will when you're asking for the salvation of your brother, sister, mother, father, whatever. So it should be something that is done in faith. And, and, and we did other episodes where we talk how to get in faith because we think we have faith, but we don't. Most, of, most times we don't. And to get in faith, whenever, whatever it pertains, if it pertains to the salvation of a loved one, well, Meditate and read those Bible verses every day for, let's say, I don't know, let's go for 21 days. 21 days without ceasing, read out loud those verses that speak of the salvation of you and your whole family in the scriptures. And guess what? Faith will come. Read it out loud, yeah. Faith read will come. Read it out loud every day. I know Saint a lady actually that did that for her daughter. She was uh, saved and uh, she became backslidden. She decided to leave the church. I forget what happened, for what reason. Uh, I think it was through a nasty divorce. Anyhow, she, she basically just left and left her ministry and left the whole thing. And her mom was was devastated, but she was a woman of faith. And she prayed those Bible promises. And she said, you say in your word, it says that if I believe this and this shall happen. It's that famous verse that says your um, you and your whole family. You and your whole family yeah. shall be saved and all that. Yeah. And she kept on prof like proclaiming, proclaiming it, proclaiming it. I believe that this is true, and I believe that this is true, and this shall happen. And always thanking God, thanking God that's going to happen. And so she wasn't begging. She wasn't like, "Please, Lord, save my daughter, bring no. her back to me." It she wasn't was just that kind reminding of the king of his promise. Exactly, and 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 it ended up happening. the 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 girl came back to to God. I think it was about a year later. She came back with a, you know, basically stronger than ever, with a stronger faith and doing great things for for God. And and uh, her ministry is wonderful. And and you know, really a woman of faith. So God answered that mother's prayer because she knew exactly how to make that happen. She knew how to pray. And yeah. Paul says it. He says, you don't know how to pray. And that's why, <laughs> and that's why the Holy Spirit intervenes in your favor by, uh, by um, um, in French it says, soupir. Uh, Supplication? Well, yeah, but kind of supplications, but I forget the, the, the exact passage, how it's worded, but it's basically saying, look, 
you guys don't even know how the Spirit actually intercedes in your favor because you don't know how to pray. And here's another thing. Uh, Paul, in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, he talks about being taken to the third heaven. He's being given some amazing revelations of heaven and of God and all that. And then he says, he talks about his thorn in the flesh. I mean, we all know about Paul's thorn in the flesh. We've heard the story many times. And then he talks, he says, he, because of the surpassing greatness of these great revelations, in order to keep me from becoming conceited, I was given a thorn in the flesh, in my flesh, a messenger of Satan to torment me. And here's what he says, and this is a fascinating verse. Verse 8, 2 Corinthians 12, verse 8 says, Three times I pleaded with the Lord to take it away from me, but he said to me, My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. And then Paul says, Therefore I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses so that Christ's power may rest on me. But that's, that's particular to Paul's particular situation and revelations. Not all of us are taken to heaven and seeing great... the amazing revelations like that. It was a particular situation. But here's what I really struck me when I read this. Paul was a man of great faith. And he was a man of prayer. And I know that Paul wasn't the type to, pr to pray the same thing every day, every day, every day, every day for the same thing. I know he was a man who prayed without ceasing. But I know he wasn't a man who prayed repetitively for the same things. And it's in that verse that we see it. It's subtle, but it's there. Paul is actually amazed that he had, that he resorted to asking God three times. Why? Because Paul is used to getting, to using his authority as a believer and to getting an answer the very first time. Why? Because he's a man of faith and a man of prayer. So for him, this was completely new. He goes like, I asked three times. He's like saying to, 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 to the Corinthians, do you realize that I actually went so low as to ask three times? And that's what he's saying. And that to me, it struck me. I was like, whoa. So Paul basically like amazed that he asked three times, that he, that he, that he did that. Because that's not in character for him. It's not something he used to do as a man of faith. He would just order the thing, talk to the mountain, speak to the mountain, and it would move out of his way. But not this time. So we all know that Paul had a very particular calling on his life and a very particular ministry. He was given an excellent revelation of heaven. He was brought to the third heaven, to the, 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 the the highest of heavens where God resides. And he saw incredible things that he says he can't even describe. And he wasn't supposed, God wanted to make sure he wouldn't get puffed up. And that's why he was given this thorn in the flesh. And there's been all kinds of conjecture about what that thorn is. He says it's a messenger of Satan to buffet him. Again, what is that? Like, was it a physical person coming to like torment him, a, a bully, or is there a demon, a literal demon that was harassing him constantly? We don't know. Some say it was a, some kind of infirmity, poor eyesight, some have said. I, I don't know. I don't have the answer to that. But I know that for this particular instance and for the completion of his particular mission on earth and purpose, Jesus refused to, to stop that after, the, after he got this vision. He allowed this to continue because he said, my grace is sufficient for you. And in a way that worked for Paul, that's what empowered his ministry was his complete dependence on God's grace. And does God say no to some of our prayers? Absolutely. Sometimes he's going to say no. But that doesn't mean you don't have authority. Uh, for example, this morning we, we had a snowstorm and uh, I have an old snowblower. I've had it for six years, and to, to be honest, I'm not a very, like... A, manual. I'm not very manual. I'm not a guy who takes very good care of my equipment. And it was stored since last winter, and I just put some uh, gas, uh, the, the thing you put in your gas to keep it uh, fresh, basically. I just put that when we stored it. But I know full well, knowing our winters and knowing my slow snowblower, that the last couple of years, when I, at this time of year, when there was a first snowstorm, I tried to start it, 
it wouldn't. And I had to get it maintained and I had to get it fixed in maintenance and call a guy and say, okay, come and pick it up and fix it. I didn't want that to happen this year. So I'm outside with my son. We're, you know, putting the gas in the gas tank, getting everything ready to start it. And I say to Jason, I say, okay, kid, uh, we want to fire it up, but we want to make sure it starts. We don't have any problems. So we're going to go order it to start in Jesus name. Are you in agreement with me, Jason? So Jason, of course, he's 10 years old. I mean, that's amazing when we're kids, right? We were, we're so fresh when it comes to faith. We're not going to be like, if I had told that to a friend who's like 35 or 40 years old, uh, and if he was not of the same conviction of me, he might have gone like, no, I'm not in agreement. I think that's dumb or that's not how we pray or Jesus doesn't answer these types of prayers. I could have gotten a multitude of answers, but from Jason, right away he said, oh, yeah, that, yeah, I'm in agreement. So we both put our hands on that snowblower and we ordered it. We ordered it to start in Jesus' name with power. And, and, and the, then we said, in Jesus' name, amen. And then I plugged it in and I started the thing and it went like, and then a big cloud of black smoke came out of it. And then it started and it was fine. And I was able to blow all the snow on my driveway and it was perfect. But that was a great lesson for Jason. He's seen the power of Jesus' name because that thing, you know, I'm happy it started because I know that that was a prayer of faith that made it start. <laughs> but, but the circumstances were not favorable to it starting. I want to make that clear here, <laughs> okay? Because it was, yeah, because it normally didn't start every previous year. Yeah, for the last two previous years, I had problems this time of year. So, so all that to say, that's how we're supposed to pray, with authority and not with... with it not, it's, for example, if we're using the example of this podcast of, of repetitive prayer... I could have been one of those like, uh, you know, a month prior praying every day that my snowblower would start for like 30 days before I actually started. Well, guess what? For 30 days, I would have prayed without faith that my snowblower would start. Would it have started? No, because I'd been without faith. Why? Because if you pray once and the next day you feel it's necessary to pray again, that means that the first day you prayed, you, you weren't in faith. And the second day, you're still not in faith because guess what? The third day you're praying again for the same thing. And the fourth day... You're, not, you're still in faith because you just erased the, the, the fake faith that you have the third day. So you're in hope. You're basically hoping it'll happen. And hope is a beginning of faith. It's like the, 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 little, the little kindling, the little uh, spark that sparks faith. That you, we all need hope. But if you're just in hope, nothing's going to happen. You need to be in faith. So in other words, to know that, the th to know that you know that you know that the thing's going to work or the thing is going to happen. Yeah, am I because, am I too am I rambling too much this? Because you know yeah, because you know that God hears you and he he will answer. The other thing, you know, obviously is to always ask things with a with a, a good heart, with good intentions. You know, God doesn't answer wants that are completely, you know, things that you know that there's no point really. It's just for, for you to either Uh, boast about what you have material things like it can't be in a sinful way it has to be something that you know that God is going to bless because it just makes sense it's a need and it revolves around either you growing your ministry to yeah. add value to people to serve others to do good in all things to do good and uh, you know to function properly because you have to remember you're an ambassador for God. So Amen. if you're you know living in something that's completely broken down, everything's dysfunctional around you. Obviously, God doesn't want you to operate in that kind of an atmosphere. So it's so that's where you know kingdom um, authority takes place, and you know God will answer those prayers to get you out of that situation. So basically, you're saying we're a man or woman on a mission. You know, we're ambassadors for Christ. We're on a mission. And what you're asking for, is it compatible with your mission? Or is it something that's going to enable your mission to be successful? And guess what? God wants your mission to be successful because he's the one who mandated you with that mission. Right. So and you, when cares. you're asking for something about that, he's going to bless that. Yeah, and he cares about your well-being. And, you know, in this case, like we're talking about a snowblower, you're like, well, what does that, a snowblower have to do with that? Well... Sebastian doesn't have the greatest back and if he has to shovel wet snow we have a huge huge driveway like yeah. I don't even know how many cars can fit in there it's like really really long because we're in the country 50, 50 feet long so maybe. if he has to do that by hand 
with a shovel, obviously it's going to be very strenuous on his back. And we're in Canada. So, there, so yeah. Yeah, the snow is, is it's not like we're talking two feet of snow here. We're not talking about uh, the two centimeters. You know what? So the, all that makes sense. You understand? So it's not like a, a you know, fake prayer of want of something that's that that's not really useful or you know that god will you know you're not you're not asking for a third corvette you know what i mean it's like some people are funny like they think that god just wants them to you know use their authority to ask for things that they don't really need that are just you know to be boastful basically and you know show-offs and stuff and yeah you know, exactly. god's not about that right no exactly it all, so, it all, there always has to be a, a practical reason for it exactly and um I want to read. Uh, I want to just finish this on the commentary. Oh because yeah, the commentary. The yes. the based on the 18th verse, he continues to say the two previous commands deal with one's time, always and continually. So as we understand this, um, you know, we're st we're to pray as a regular part of our day. You know. Um, so we're to pray always and continually, not repetitively. And not always asking. Prayer is also thanking God. It's praising God. It's communion with God. There it's talking go. to God about all the Proclaiming little things. Proclaiming with your tongue. Yeah, confessing things that you want to happen. Um, thanking Him in advance for the things that you just prayed. All that is part of your spiritual daily life, okay? During the whole day, not just half an hour in the morning. And one thing we forgot to mention, uh, maybe you can talk about that after you finish the, the commentary, but is, is also praying also can be at times rebuking the devil. Uh, because sometimes when your your prayer or your, your, you, you sense that something is blocking, that could be the enemy trying to block it, uh, the thing from happening. Yeah, there are times where There's you have to. Times for that. Yeah, to to use your authority to to stop whatever you feel is really hindering um, your life or your children's lives or something that you know has to do with the sin in you know in the midst of you know it could be your son or something that happens and you know that the devil's like like a roaring lion lo looking for who he can devour. You know, there's been all kinds of instances in our lives where we're not perfect. We sin, you know, things happen. And sometimes you see that, no, okay, this is not normal. Like the, the devil is really trying to get a foothold in my family. I don't yeah. like this. And you're going to have to pray it off and use your, your kingdom authority to pray it off. So that's that can be another way where you're, you know, using your authority and praying. So it says also... Um, Christians are to give thanks to God in every circumstance of life. The fact that God works everything together for good for those who love him mm -hmm. is the basis for this entreaty. So these three exhortations in verses 16 to 18 are not just good advice. They are God's will for every Christian. Amen and amen. So we were talking like the, the three things that he's talking about, like uh, the sandwich we, we were talking about, right? Yeah, they are not the totality of God's will, but they are a clear and important segment of it. God's will means joy, prayer, and thanksgiving amen. for those who are in Christ Jesus. That's perfect. And it's a great way to. I don't. I don't know if you want to add more, but it's. I think it's a great way to uh, finish the podcast. Uh, this yeah, week. absolutely. So I hope that this helped you because I know that a lot of you, um, you know, I've talked to a lot of Christians through the years, and um, you know, I think that a lot of Christians have this misconception, this myth that they they you know need to pray repetitively, and that means that they're super faithful. And I hope that this podcast really helped you to see that there's another way to pray that's effective yeah. and that gets God's attention and that will get um, you to have a, a deeper relationship with God because your faith is going to increase. The more you pray in this way, the more you will see God answer prayer in your life and manifest these these things in your life and you're going to be so excited your kids are going to be excited yeah like there's been so many wonderful things that have happened and even recently because we've been using this properly effectively and seeing miracles seeing things happen that our kids are like wow this is awesome like this is amazing you know and so i encourage you to do the same thing yeah, and, and always remember, if it's a promise, if it's in the Word, if it's something that He said, if God said it, uh, if it's not happening when you pray for it, it's simple. The solution is, it's not on God. It's not. See, most Christians will go like, 
well, I've prayed for the salvation for, of so-and-so in my family for five years and it hasn't happened. I guess it wasn't God's will. Whoa, back up, time out. It's God's will that, that all should be saved. So if you've prayed for it and it didn't happen, it's not on God, it's on you. You've been praying out of faith. You've been praying without faith and thinking you were in faith, but you were just in hope. You know, so you need to correct your, your basically like uh, do like Liz said, go back, read those verses for uh, maybe yeah. a month and, and, and immerse yourself in them, believe them and then pray once. And guess what? It's going to happen. And see the difference. If you're praying for that person and you're saying, Lord, please, you know, bring John to you, uh, you know, work in his heart and and let him see the light and let him accept you for, as his Lord and Savior. And you're praying this every day, every day, every day, every day, every day. That means every day you're not, you're you're not losing, believing him. You're, you're exactly. And, and what happens is your prayer doesn't sound as strong as it used to. And then it yeah. sound, kind of sounds repetitively and weak. And, and in reality, you don't really, really, really believe because you're at the point now that you're hoping it may happen after all this time that goes by. So there's a big difference in doing it this way and going back to God's scripture that says, you know, that um, he will save your family if you believe in him. And you know what I'm talking about. Go back to that verse and say it out loud and repeat, like, like say it out loud and be determined and thank God because it says that. That's his promise. Thank you, God, because you promised in your word. It says this and this and this. You don't remember what verse it is? No, but... but <laughs> <laughs> we both have a blank. Okay, yeah, great. but that's fine. That, we know it's in the Bible. That's all that matters. Uh, but here's the thing, too. When you pray repetitively, what you don't realize is that you're hurting your faith. When you pray for something in hope and instead of in faith for five years every day, you're losing ground. Your faith is basically eroding every day. It's eroding. Why? Because every day you're not getting the answer to your prayer. So that the devil can come in and start using it against you, starting pointing a finger at God saying, you see, he doesn't hear you. He doesn't love you. He doesn't. And I've, I know a lot of believers yeah, who, because they've been praying for so long for a thing and the thing didn't happen, the devil used that against them and they fell away and they stopped believing. So don't pray when you're not in faith. It's only going to hurt you. And it's not a way to pray. Same thing for healing. Absolutely. And you know, that that's a very good example. You know, I've known a lot of Christians that, um, you know, were praying for healing and it didn't happen after a certain time. And then they just thought, you know, God just doesn't want to heal my son, my daughter, and just felt like, who am I serving? Like, why would he not heal my child? And, and thinking that all of a sudden, the God that they believe is good is not good. And they don't exactly. realize that all of that is related to your kingdom authority and the way you need to pray and the way you need to grow your faith, to have that faith, to pray on those promises. Because it does say in scripture that God, uh, you know, that Jesus died on the cross for your transgressions and for uh, by his stripes you are healed and all all those those are real promises so yeah. he's not a liar and so he's if he's not God a liar yesterday and today and forever exactly if and he's he not used a liar, to heal and he can still heal today exactly he's the same god he was and he still is today so that makes you question huh so what what am i missing here what is the the you know the missing link here is that Oftentimes, we just don't know how to build up our faith. Mm -hmm. And it's by repeating God's word in the sense you're, you're proclaiming, you're, you're his confessing his promises, you're believing his promises. The more I can assure you, if it's about healing, you read those promises three times a day, every day, every day, every day. You're going to grow in that faith that you're going to believe that it's going to happen. And, and then, then it's just going to come out of you. Because at some point, your faith is there. You've built up that faith over time. And when the faith is there, guess what? You're gonna order that thing to happen. You're gonna be, you're gonna move the mountain. You're gonna tell that mountain, get up, move out of the way, and go throw yourself in the sea, and it's gonna obey you because you built up your faith to get to that point instead of being a beggar repetitively every day before God and not doing things according to the way He set them for you to do them. Like there's a way to to pray and there's a way not to pray. Just before we conclude, 
it was really bugging me. So <laughs> I went to get that verse that we were talking about salvation. So it's in Acts chapter 16, verse 31. Uh, this is from the New International Version. They replied, believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved, you and your household. This was Paul and Silas. These are the things that you need to be repeating um, and not, like we said, not repetitively, but say in your word, it says, you know. Um, and I thank you for it. And, and Exactly. It. In, in this instance, this is what was said. And I believe this to be true for my household, for Amen. my family. And uh, to, to confess those prayers out loud and uh, to repeat them um, as something that you're believing in faith for and thanking God in advance because this is in his word and that you know he's going to answer and that he's faithful and praising him. All that goes with your daily living. So, um, And the same thing for healing. So, um, And if you found this uh, podcast valuable, I hope that you'll share it with your friends and family. We wish you a great week. Be blessed and thrive on. For more free resources and content, make sure to visit thrivingonpurpose.com 